What's going on, guys? Welcome back to CSC Plus. I apologize for my voice. I am feeling a little bit sick as of today, but I still want to go through this episode because we have a ton in the combat sport world to go over this week. We have the UFC fight night, which we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go through every fight on the card. I'm going to give you a brief preview, and then I will post separate videos that include my best bets in the next couple days, but this will just be breakdowns of all the events, and you will hear them in the videos in the future, but I also want to take a look at some of the news stories for next week. A lot of fights dropping out, a lot of replacements coming in, a lot of exciting news, and then we also have a YouTube boxing event, Misfit. You have Logan Paul, you have Dylan Dennis, who's a mixed martial arts person. You have Tommy Fury Boxer versus KSI. I know a good bit about the social media personalities and what they do, and I know who they're fighting, so that's going to be a really, really good event, but I want to start this video with the hardcores, with where this channel's foundation is from, and that's going to start in the UFC fight night. We'll start from the bottom, work our way up. We got a 12 fight card. We have six fights on the main card, six fights on the prelims. We have a lot of places to maybe lay some money, but again, you'll see those in the videos. Let's just have a look at some of the matchups and an outline of them. We'll start with two rather wide odd spreads. You have Ashley Oder versus Emily Ducat. Ashley Oder is really getting no love against Emily in this fight as a three to one underdog. Both ladies have struggled to get their footing, but it does look like Ashley Oder is probably Probably on the edge of getting cut. She's three and seven in the UFC, eight and eight overall which is not a record the UFC really likes to have on their roster. On edge, it might light a fire under her, but a huge underdog in this fight. I'm interested to see who takes the victory in it, but again, I probably will keep my money away from it. Then I'll probably lean Emily Ducote as well as my pick, but let's move on. Chris Gutierrez versus Alatang Healy. The second fight, Chris Gutierrez recently looking like a world beater before being defeated by Pedro Munoz. They gave him a huge step up in his last fight against Pedro Munoz and Munoz got a decision. So I caught Pedro Munoz by decision back when they did fight when they fought Munoz was actually the underdog Gutierrez was that hot up and comer who was riding a couple finishes like a six fight win streak he was absolutely dominating people but they're bringing him back down to the lower half of the rankings I don't even think Alatang is ranked in the division in the bantamweight division so this is definitely going to be a spot where Gutierrez should be the favorite he is seeing four to one favorite lines here he, Alatang Ely can make this far more competitive in my opinion if he makes use of his wrestling pedigree however if we look back on both guys recent fights based on past decision making it's unlikely that Healy will go that route will try to take Gutierrez down and in a one-on-one -on -one stand up affair I do think Gutierrez has the has the advantage the matchup in my opinion you have the better range manager in Gutierrez Gutierrez uses better kicks involves knees whereas Alatang Healy is a powerful counter striker he sits in his shots but I think Gutierrez will have the edge against the Chinese rep. Then you got Russian Ronda Rousey. I did make a video again when she matched up against Stephanie Egger. And in that fight, she was a massive underdog and she submitted Egger in the first round. Now she's getting a little more respect, but against a newcomer opponent, a 5-0 English woman in Melissa Dixon, this should be a good fight. Irene, basically a newcomer to the UFC. She's had one fight, that Egger fight, but she's going to look to to impress again. They, they know her as Russian Ronda. You can tell by that moniker. She is a wrestler. She she looks for submissions and she's very good at what she does. This will be an exciting fight to watch. I might even see the Alex Siva side, depending on the odds that we do get later on in the week. Then Terrence McKinney takes on a short notice opponent, newcomer Brandon Morote. Brandon is 9-1 as a professional, and it's in the lightweight division. This follows the withdrawal of the originally submitted opponent for McKinney in Chris Duncan. So McKinney will still have a full camp in this matchup compared to Brandon, who doesn't. The Scotsman is reportedly out due to visa issues, no injuries or anything that I could find. Morote is getting very little love as the short notice opponent. He's a 4-1 to one underdog coming into the matchup. He comes from Combat Zone as one of their top lightweights, but again, not a great indie organization by any means. Brandon is a good striker from what I've seen. He has balanced grappling, so he doesn't look very poor anywhere. So he's pretty good, very well balanced, very respectable in cage performances. He hasn't fought the same level of competition nearly as Terrence McKinney in any way, shape, or form without the short notice of the fight. I think this the odds would be more around plus 200, plus 250 on the Brandon side, but when you get these short notice bouts, you're going to get the bigger money. So if you want to take a shot there, you can, but for me, there's just too much unknown, and Brandon doesn't look that great to me, and Terrence just has no value, as had the full fight camp and is taking on an absolute newcomer to the UFC. So, we can go on to a fight I'm rather excited about, Tanera Lisboa versus Ravina Vera. It's a couple of newcomers to the UFC roster. Lisboa, who is getting a lot of love in the lines, which I believe she sh clearly should be after a UFC debut win against Jessica Rose Clark. In the win, she showed the speed of her punches, knees, and more. She has a Muay Thai background, and her opponent 
opponent's game plan takedowns. They're going to game plan takedowns against her. There's no way Ravina doesn't look for takedowns in this fight. Ravina actually is pretty solid in jujitsu, but again, very amateurish in her footage. But nonetheless, Lisboa is strong and an okay wrestler in her own right. She's able to defend takedowns. She did it a lot it, against Jessica Rose Clark, even though she did give up some takedowns. But clearly, the hands turned Rose Clark into a wrestler out of defense. And in the second round, Lisboa did real, real damage as the better striker. She was taken down by Clark in the third round, like I mentioned. But we got a positive look at Tanero, who works from the bottom to get back to her feet. And once she gets back to her feet, she kind of, it's a gut punch to her opponent. If Lisboa can keep the fights on the feet, she will be a scary opponent for anybody. And she actually got back to her feet in the third round and finished Rose Clark via submission, a rear naked choke, which was impressive. Tanero is a two-time Muay Thai champion. Her record is well-rounded with two TKOs, two submissions, and a corner stoppage. And also notable, Tanera's previous career before the UFC, she fought Valentina Shevchenko in Muay Thai. And we all know the acumen of Valentina Shevchenko striking. And her only one of her only two losses was her pro debut. And that was against a bantamweight Norma Dumont, who's ranked number 11 now in the UFC. Ravina, on the other hand, much less to see in her career. She hasn't fought in the UFC yet. She's a much more wild striker, very amateur striking. It's going to play right into what Tanera does well here. It seems like the UFC is providing a spot for Lisboa to land a big finish and pad her style and pad her highlight reel. Ravina will probably again look to grapple, no doubt in my mind, but man, the lack of any real competition on her 7-1 and one record combined with very, very amateurish striking. Tanera, I believe, should breeze through this fight. Ravina could have a potential future to make a jump with good training. She has been competing in combat since what appears to me to be her whole life, so I do like this matchup. I think Tanera is going to be a well-known name very soon in the women's bantamweight division. I'm just excited to see her early parts of her UFC career. So we can get on to Derek Elkins, the damage. He takes on TJ Brown, Darren Elkins. This is a good matchup, a fun matchup. I won't be putting money anywhere near this fight, but I hope Darren Elkins gets the win here. He's a veteran, a legend of the sport. It'll be fun to see. And TJ Brown is, is also a great fighter in his own right, but does only have a 14 and 10 record, which is not as impressive. So this one, a fun fight, featherweight division. And then we get on to the good stuff. We get to the main card. We open the main card with an awesome fight and something that you don't often see in UFC matches. It matched up two rising prospects and we get that this Saturday night where Cameron Simon takes on Christian Rodriguez. At only two, 22 years old, the South African product Cameron has already gathered three victories in the UFC. Meanwhile, 25-year-old Christian Rodriguez is coming off a win that continues to age like fine wine in Rahul Rosas Jr. And we've seen what Rahul has done since this loss. This should be a war between two high-level strikers who are currently looking to embolden their name on the UFC's list of potential challengers in the ranks at 135 pounds. These two very young, very promising prospects in a division flooded with talent. They're both gifted strikers with developing grappling that has made them more well-rounded as they've accumulated in cage time with the UFC. I'm expecting to see a better version of both guys on Saturday, but I'll ride with the South African talent who continue to have a very, very good year. And in a 50 50 fight, in my opinion, I'll roll with the plus 130 underdog in Cameron Simon. Then we get Edgar Cherez versus Daniel Arceda, and this is coming off of their controversial fight on UFC Nocha. The flyweight bout between Edgar and Daniel on UFC Noche was ruled a no contest after ref mistakenly thought Daniel was put to sleep by Edgar's standing guillotine choke in round one, and the premature stoppage shifted the odds another point towards the original favorite, Edgar Cherez. He gets in at 3-1 to one versus around 2-1 to one in their original fight. Then you get to a middleweight bout between an exciting stand-up fighter. It kicks off with a bang. Michelle Pereira is probably being forced up to middleweight, in my opinion. The last time we had notable experience from him was when he missed weight and lost his opportunity to take on Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Now, he was originally matched up against Mark andre Barriolt, but Barriolt on social media was forced to withdraw with an injury. Short notice again, I believe has the impact on the lines. Andre Petrovsky, I believe, would have been the favorite coming into this fight with full fight camps, but because Petrovsky does have some cardio issues, Pereira is not the best in cardio either, but Petrovsky does have cardio issues. I do think that this does favor Pereira, who is still a very big welterweight. He's going to be the taller guy, even though he's the welterweight coming up to middleweight. I do think this is going to be an exciting fight. Pereira has tuned his striking way more since he debuted in the UFC. He came in with a very capable style and now he's kind of fine-tuned that he's looking for big shots he's finding them too so he has looked very very impressive it's in cage maturity that seems to have developed for him i'm interested to see how 185 pounds looks on him probably won't make a play anywhere near this fight until we see them on the scales but either way him being him being a pretty good anti-wrestler in his own right with neither guy having a clear cardio advantage where that is most likely the way i see Pereira losing fights i'll probably end up picking michelle in this fight and it if nothing else, this will be a fun battle between two 
really, really good middleweights. Then Jonathan Martinez takes on Adrian Yanez in another banger fight in the middle of the main card. Yanez is in a bounce back spot against Martinez before the recent pay-per-view loss to Rob Font. Yanez was on an absolute tear. Six wins in a row, five straight performance bonuses, landing a knockdown in five of six of those fights. Martinez remains on a tear in his own right and has not lost a fight after entering the UFC going on an average run of four and three in his first seven UFC bouts. Martinez has now found his form, winning five straight and earning the very slight nod in the matchup with an implied win chance of around 53%. His record comprised of eight TK KOKOs, two submissions. Martinez, a very dangerous and strong fighter. Martinez, in an interesting stylistic matchup, Yanez is sharp on the feet. His stand up is some of the cleanest in the bantamweight division. I made a bet breakdown for Rob Font versus Yanez. I think I actually picked that one wrong. I think I was on the Yanez side. But nonetheless, Martinez is striking is more Muay Thai based. He's awesome with elbows. He's awesome with knees, as we saw in the Cub Swanson fight. Plus, when you look at his top control, he is a tough outing for anybody. This fight is going to be a good one. Looking at the fight in the macro, both have had a high strength of schedule. Martinez took outside Nurmagomedov in his last fight as a near three to one underdog that's what's putting him on the map in my opinion to be the favorite here and he showed some heart in that fight we saw early in his career he might have lacked it a little bit but now he was down the first round in significant fashion he came back in one round two and three defeating Nurmagomedov again as a huge underdog this fight is going to be awesome and originally I was thinking just looking at this as a book cover I thought man I can't believe Martinez is the favorite I'm going to hammer Yanez but you look at his recent run he's looked really really good his striking has improved his heart has improved proof I'm excited to see how this fight goes. I'm not going to lie to you. I'll be looking at fighter props, striking props for this fight. If both guys can survive a lengthy period of time, I will post that in a video if I break down this fight. But nonetheless, we get to the co-main event in the women's flyweight division. It's an interesting fight between two Brazilians. Jennifer Maia landed more strikes than in Casey O'Neill in her last fight. Maia is eighth in significant strikes across the women's flyweight division in her career and was a former Invicta flyweight champion, primarily a striker. Jennifer has been to 10 decisions out of her 11 UFC fights, so we can assume that that that's the route she'll continue to try and follow. Maya is strong, which makes her a solid anti-wrestler and, and a good wrestler in her own right. And she's a very, very good jujitsu player. This is going to be put to good use against a girl like Vivian Arujo. Often giving up height and reach, Maya still finds ways to outstrike her opponents, which is impressive. Vivian, on the other hand, is coming off back-to-back -back losses for the first time in her career and again against very, very good opponents. She's landed a takedown in seven of her nine fights and outlands opponents in this regard 17-2. to two. Her UFC career is also decision-heavy with basically a 90% decision rate this fight should probably see the final bell nothing besides fight lines at this point i think maya's defensive wrestling and jujitsu will keep her safer for long enough moments of the fight i think this fight has a lot of potential to rack up significant strikes so again i'll be watching that when it comes to fighter props here but maya has around a 60 percent implied odd to win the fight this should be again another good fight in the women's flyweight division but probably a long one it's going to drag out and it probably a decision one for sure and then you have the main event a featherweight clash between again veteran edson barbosa who's competing against the highest level of mixed martial arts since UFC 100 in the 2010s. A legend of mixed martial arts who deserves everything from both his fighting style to the loyalty to the company. Featuring in his 13th main or co-main event, this guy has been a staple for the UFC. His opponent in his first ever UFC main event, Super Sadiq Yusuf. By the numbers, Yusuf looks more impressive. 5.29 significant strikes per 5 minutes to Edson's 4. Yusuf strikes absorb per minute, 3.65 to Edson's 4.12. And Yusuf striking accuracy at 49% to Edson's 44%. But numbers are just that. Numbers. Yusuf is 6-1 and one in the UFC. And his loss was his co-main event in his biggest spot of his career against Arnold Allen. It is clear here, though. Edson is getting older, and his career has seen many changes throughout. We all know him as an explosive striker, and it's a rarity even now for any striker to have an advantage on the feet against him. I guess... Giga Chikadze is the last guy to do it, but it was an extremely close stand-up affair. Yusuf is getting the minus 160 number, age obviously playing a factor. They're leaning on the guy with more potential, more fire probably. But Eileen Barbosa wins anytime he's against a primarily stand-up opponent. But I'll in be interested to see Sadiq's game plan in the fight. Sadiq is a smart fighter. He has a YouTube channel where he breaks down fights and you can tell... He has, a, he has a mind for the fight game, so I'm interested, again, to see his game plan and where he might go in this fight. But again, if you guys want picks and stuff, make sure you keep an eye out for Saturday's podcast where we pick the full UFC card, and then I will be posting single videos that will start with the intro that I just presented to you guys, but we'll probably have a play when they come out. So make sure you guys keep an eye out for that. But that'll wrap up UFC Vegas 80 preview, and we're going to get on to some other news in the combat sport world, and we'll keep it in the UFC. Start with some of the news from yesterday. The UFC is parting ways with USADA as they 
Fair Drug Enforcement Independent Entity. And there, this was a hard fallout so far. USADA came out in the UFC's terms. USADA came out and used McGregor to kind of push a narrative about why the UFC is moving away from USADA. Dana White came out very angry against it. Hunter Campbell came out very angry against it. Jeff Nowitzki came out very angry against it. They're threatening legal action about it. Defamation probably going to come into play, trying to say that the UFC doesn't care about drug testing and they're just doing different things for Conor McGregor. And kind of, honestly, another piece that I took from some of the things that I watched yesterday, they have kind of probably knew Conor McGregor was using import performance enhancers to heal. Now, depends on your outlook on that. I don't know if it's a, a bad thing to do that. Where he broke his leg and he was probably using some form of performance enhancer to recover from that leg injury and it probably wasn't even a fact about trying to cheat the sport or anything like that but just something that was required so that he could walk again so I do understand that but it did sound like he was on some sort of performance enhancer we don't know what it is what would help with that I'm not a physician to tell you but he was probably on something there and now he is getting off of it he's entering the USADA testing pool and Hunter did say Hunter Campbell did say that they wanted to wait till Conor McGregor was fully healthy before entering him into the USADA six-month testing. So this is a follow, but I think the follow between the UFC and USADA was coming for the start of 2024, no matter what. That is when they will cease testing with USADA. They're going to be moving to this private independent. I saw some hilarious things. That's a very interesting thing. I'm interested to see how the UFC decides to drug test its athletes, how serious they're going to be about it, if they're going to continue to be very strong pushers of anti-doping in the sport. It's going to be a weird shift, and I'm concerned, hopefully, that the athletes get a good knowledge of what's going to come, and this shift is hopefully better for the athletes than worse. But nonetheless, that was the information that was yesterday. Then earlier in the week, we got a huge shakeup for UFC 294. We'll start with the third fight on the card. Paulo Costa was trying to reach the fight with Hamza, but he had elbow surgery. Often opens up very quickly, so I don't think Paulo Costa was ready for that. It probably opened up during training. It was only like a couple weeks out that he had the surgery, so kind of stupid planning there by Paulo Costa, but we don't know what, what circumstances caused for this. But nonetheless, we got Kamaru Usman coming up from 170 pounds to take on Hamza Chiamayev. I don't think this has any impact on where Hamza will be with a win. I think he's going to be right there in the title picture. I don't think he would have jumped Duplessis or Israel Adesanya for the next matchup either way. But now Hamza, if he does defeat Usman at 185 pounds, they probably will put him in the 170 title picture as well, even though his weight has been an issue there. It's a great fight. A big fight. I think that Hamza should have the advantage everywhere in my opinion. The bigger guy. But we were thinking Usman was going to be fighting Hamza just a couple years ago at a 170 pounds. So this is a super fight. Hamza's going to get way more media with this fight in my opinion and it's going to be super duper exciting the only negative in my opinion that you can look at is Usman coming off the couch on basically 10 days notice to fight up a weight class people are going to take that against Hamza Chiamayev but still whether he defeated Paulo Costa whether he defeated Kamaru Usman in this spot I think that he's still going to be in the same spot when it comes to the title picture and he's going to be right there in the top three top four op options for Sean Strickland or Israel Adesanya when they uh, have their rematch, which I think we can all assume is going to be happening very soon. But then you move on to another shift in the title picture. The main event of UFC 294, Islam Makashev loses Charles Oliveira to a brutal cut above the eye. Charles had to withdraw due to the cut. And we get Volkanovski also on around 15 to 10 days notice flying. I think it's in Abu Dhabi, so he's going to have to fly out there. And he's going to get his rematch with Islam Makashev. This is very, very interesting. I am i don't know if this was a smart move by Volkanovski, because if he does lose this fight now, he's going to be 0-2. I know there's more excuses on the side of Volkanovski, in my opinion. A guy with a full camp, even though he has to switch opponents, and, and now he knows that he's going to be fighting probably a guy with a different style, better wrestling defense. Um, more tight boxing and stuff like that, and a shorter guy for sure. So he's going to have to adjust his style a little bit. But again, training camp is training camp. And Volkanovski was probably not in one. Whether he was training is going to be a big question, but I highly doubt he was. Nobody just trains for things when they don't have an announcement or they don't have a look at where they're going to be fighting next. So I doubt he was in a training camp or a serious training camp, Volkanovski that be. And I think that Islam is going to take this fight. Now Volk's going to be 0-2 to Islam and probably have no, no argument to get a third fight against him, which is a bad decision for him but again the excuses are on the side of Volkanovski here Islam is saying don't blame it on short notice but how can you not blame it on short notice it's 10 days he's coming off the couch it's tough not to tough not to relate that to that but UFC 294 was already great but this shift is even better in my opinion I love the Volk Islam 2 fight I love the super fight feel of Usman versus Chimaev we're just gonna have to wait for weigh-ins to see if anything shifts 
anymore. Like, if there's going to be any more, is Gamrot going to get in there? Is Volk going to miss weight or something? Well, it's going to be interesting. But then, finally, we'll wrap this one up with the Misfits YouTube predictions on Saturday. We'll probably do this on the Friday podcast, but I'm going to do it now. You got KSI taking on Tommy Fury. I'm going to take Tommy Fury to win. I'm excited, excited to see if KSI would win. That would shake up shit, in my opinion. That would just cause for wildness, in my opinion. I think Tommy is very, very likely going to win this, win this one. And then you got Logan Paul versus Dylan Danis. The question is, do the mental games have an effect for Danis? And when this fight gets later on, when this fight gets into the couple of the later rounds, can Dylan start to put things together if he's not stopped early? Logan Paul has issues with cardio. We saw when he fought KSI, and this was when KSI wasn't the greatest fighter. Logan's probably been training more, but still, I'm interested to see if Danis could pull it off. There was a lot of mind games from Dylan Danis to Logan Paul's fiance, Nina Agdahl. I'm interested to see if that has an impact. I'll probably still ride with Logan Paul but don't be surprised if Dylan Dennis late in this fight starts to pick up momentum and might even win this one. But Logan Paul, Tommy Fury, Salt Poppy versus Slim. I know if you're not into this YouTube boxing scene, you probably don't know much about this uh, matchup, but there was a lot coming into this matchup between these two guys. Slim wanted more money before the fight was announced, but then they got it signed for the prime card. This is going to be a good fight. I think Slim wins. I think Slim will probably do... It won't be an embarrassing performance for Salt Poppy by any means. Salt Poppy could land a shot and Salt Poppy looks to be in, in incredible shape. But Slim is slick. He's great with his hands. He's, he's great with movement in the boxing ring. I really like Slim as a YouTube boxer. I think that he takes the win in this one. Dean the Great versus Waleed Sharks this is a rematch. I'm going to take Dean the Great again. King Kenny versus Anthony Taylor. Anthony Taylor was a mixed martial artist, a boxer. Somehow got pushed into this YouTube boxing scene. I'm going to stick with... Anthony Taylor in this one. Then when Anderson Nunez, I'm going to take him over my mate Nate. Uh, tag match, I don't really give a damn about. I don't give a damn about the rest of the fights on this card. Probably take Ed Matthews, Pineda, B. Dave, uh, Astrid Wet, Chase Damore, and SX, I guess. But I don't really care. No, DTG, sorry. I don't really care much about the later fights on this card. The main card is a good one. And I will be watching. 2 p.m. Eastern, the main card is expected to start on DAZN and pay-per-view.com. So you guys can check out the prices on that. But that'll wrap up today's video, guys. Make sure you keep an eye out for tomorrow. We'll have our picks for the NFL against the spread and the picks for the entire UFC card and keep an eye out for betting and gambling videos that will be coming today and tomorrow. So I will see you in the next one. Peace out guys.